All right, we'll get started now. Um, thank you all for coming out. I was just telling um, Christine and Jennifer that I'm reminded the last time we had this in person, the last time we had the burst talk in person, we left and didn't come back for a year. So um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day. So, um, so it's nice to be back here in person and not virtual. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Adam Braver. I'm the interim dean of the library. Um, I also, my usual role in the library is the, um, the library program director, of which I work quite a bit on this, pro this burst program. So I do feel very um, connected and committed to it. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, because I see right next, sitting side by side, are Jim Takach and Christine Fagan, who worked for many, many years on the BURST program before, um, before I was involved and overlapping when I, when I got involved. So. Um, so this is the 24th anniversary of the BURST Memorial Program. And this year we celebrate The Street by Ann Petrie a book whose relevance still holds so true and so fierce and so important that one could imagine it having been published in the past year, reaffirming the uh, famous expression of the ancient Greek philosopher Thales Miletus that, quote, time is the wisest of all things that are, for it brings everything to light. So first, I want to thank, he's not here, but I want to thank Bob Blaze, who was the class of 1970 at Roger Williams University, who endowed this program in honor of his mentor, John Howard Burse, who, as a young man, Bob met by chance one afternoon. And as those of us in higher education know, that meaning led to Bob's life and world really being opened up from being exposed to the knowledge and insights shared by Professor Burse. Um, I also want to thank who is here, um, Bob Blaze's daughter, Jennifer, who has been a tremendous partner with us over the past several years, um, standing in for, for her father um, on, um, on administering this program from their side. I want to thank the Burst Committee with representation from many disciplines here at RWU, as well as our community partner, Rogers Free Library, who um, is part of that committee. Um, and I want to point out Susan Tayson, who represents who is also teaching here, but represents uh, Rogers Free Library, um, who brought the street to our attention um, and passionately advocated for us to celebrate it. And from our side, um, I, you know, I'd like to thank you know, my agent, my, my director, my producer. My, uh, from our side, uh, archivist Heidi Benedict has been essential to creating the exhibitions. And afterwards, if you haven't seen it, you should look at the exhibition out there and spend some time with it. Heidi will, um, I'm sure, be around um, to answer questions. Another key player, and often behind the scenes, is Liz Battaglia, who without fanfare or a call for attention, contributes to the exhibition in ways that simply bring it to life. And while we're at it, Thelma DiZallo, Chris Truskowski, Cindy Jones, all lend support in essential ways that only serve to raise the level of the BURST program. And finally, I want to introduce our two BURST fellows, student fellows, Cassandra Bousquet and Shelby Ganey, sitting right here in front. Um, I had the pleasure of accompanying them on research visits to the Beinecke Library at Yale, where we poured through the original manuscripts of the street and later to the old Saybrook Historical Society, where we were treated to a behind the scenes exhibition on Ann Petrie and her family and their legacy and heritage in that town. At each stop of the way, Cassandra and Shelby participated in decision making about how this exhibition would be shaped, the types of artifacts we could showcase, and the type of keynote talk we would have, which leads me to our speaker, Dr. Jesse Nasta specializes in the history of slavery, emancipation, and their aftermaths, with a particular emphasis on New England. He has been a professor in Wesleyan University's African American Studies Department since 2017, and is the executive director of the Middlesex County Historical Society in Middletown, Connecticut. He's speaking today as a, as a personal friend and a research collaborator of Ann Petrie's daughter, Elizabeth Petrie, who um, sadly and unexpectedly passed away um, last year. Um, so please welcome him as he talks about Ann Petrie, her work, and her amazing family. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have my own long list of thanks to start with. So first, thank you so much to Director Adam Braver for inviting me. I was thrilled to get this invitation and to be here today. Um, thank and acknowledge your wonderful university archivist, Heidi Benedict, for, for this incredible exhibit and to the student fellows. Um, it's, I'm thrilled to see the exhibit uh, in person for the first time. Um, and thank to Cindy Jones for your patience with all the logistics of setting today up. So thank you again. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as, as you were told, um, I'm speaking as a historian, but really I came to Ann Petrie's life and family through my personal friendship with Ann Petrie's only daughter, Liz Petrie Riley, who as you heard um, unexpectedly and very sadly passed away last year. So during my talk today, I'll be reading some prepared statements, but I will interrupt myself a lot with stories about Liz, stories about the family, because this history is just so personal to me, so personal to Liz, um, that it's not just an academic subject, it's a friendship, and I kind of feel like an honorary part of the family, having grown up uh, close to Liz and hearing stories about her family. So um, to start with, we'll keep coming back to this image, but this is kind of the, the, the image that Liz Petrie used most in her writing about the family. Um, on the, the, the young woman, the child really on the right, that's Anne Petrie's mother. So the novelist Anne Petrie's mother, Bertha James Lane. This photo was taken in Hartford, Connecticut in the late 1880s. Um, so really you can see that this family right here, it's Hartford, 1880s, only two decades after the Civil War. The, these children were the children of formerly enslaved parents. So just visually you could see that within two decades, um, Anne Petrie's grandparents had escaped from slavery in Virginia and Alabama, made their way to Connecticut, were not only free, but middle class, gave their daughters and sons piano lessons and elocution lessons and music lessons and nothing that, that was denied them that they could humanly give them, right? And that really set the stage for the next generations, kind of, that's the childhood that Ann Petrie's mother had, and then you can kind of see where Ann Petrie came from a generation later knowing that. Um, we usually say middle class, but that's such shorthand for what they, for the fullness of their education and dignity. Um, so I'll keep coming back to this image. A quick outline, um, so just I'll start with an overview of this family, uh, who they were. Um, Connecticut, it, well, talk about Hartford, Connecticut, and Old Saybrook, which are the communities that they came from, the communities that shaped this family, and that really are the backdrop for most of Ann Petrie's writing. Old Saybrook, Hartford, New London come up again and again in her larger body of work um, beyond the street. Um, then I want to give you a background on Ann Petrie's development, who she was as a writer, as a person, and then finally, at the end, talk about Ann Petrie sort of in the fullness of who she was enmeshed in this tiny town of Old Saybrook and all the family ties. Her whole family was around her, shaped who she was, and also um, shaped her writing throughout her life. So this is Liz Petrie, um, Ann Petrie's only daughter. So I just want to start with Liz, both to honor her, give some context for why I care about the family, how I came to this story, and kind of locate Liz within this larger lineage. So as you see here, Liz Petrie was uh, the only child of best-selling novelist Ann Petrie and Ann Petrie's husband, George Petrie. Uh, Liz was born in Old Saybrook, Connecticut in 1949, uh, when her mother, Ann Petrie, was almost 41. And sadly, Liz passed away unexpectedly last year, February 22nd, 2023, at age 74. In a lot of ways, I feel almost like Liz is representative today, in the sense that uh, she would and would be here speaking to you if she could today. Um, she spoke tirelessly and relentlessly about the family and shared and advocated for their history. Um, I'll, in a few minutes, I'll be playing a short video clip where you can see and hear Liz herself. But one of the last things she did was collaborate with me and a few other scholars on an exhibit at the Old Saybrook Historical Society on her family, which is where she, her hometown, her mother's hometown. Um, so I want to give you that background. Um, one of the last things she did in October 2022 before she passed away was attend the ceremony for the naming of a street after her mom, Ann Petrie, in Harlem. So right up until the end, she was speaking sometimes with me, sometimes with others, and advocating for this history. Um, and how I came to the family history, how I came to this topic, how I came to African American history, um, I had the good fortune of growing up in Middletown, Connecticut, just five doors from Liz Petrie and her husband, Larry Riley, um, and knowing them since I was a child as a result. 
Um, Liz's stories of her remarkable, best-selling novelist mother, Anne Petrie, um, inspired me to pursue my college degree and then my PhD in African American history. Um, Liz was one of my first and best academic mentors, and by the time she passed away, one of my closest friends, despite our 35-year age gap, and I would say also because of it. Um, Liz didn't get married to Larry until she was in her 50s and had no children of her own. So in a lot of ways, I kind of felt like a surrogate nephew who helped take the story into the next generation because Liz knew she was kind of the last generation in this lineage going from Ann Petrie's grandparents to Ann Petrie's parents to Ann Petrie and then to Liz. Um, so that, uh, that was kind of how I was placed in all of this. Um, in terms of who Liz was as a person and writer. I should just briefly acknowledge and mention um, Christy Billings is here from Middletown. She's the director of library programs in Middletown's public library, the Russell Library. And for a decade, just completely on her own volition, um, Liz Petrie ran a writing group for veterans, mostly World War II, Korean and Vietnam veterans. They met every week for 10 years at the Middletown Public Library. Um, and she, so she was the kind of person who um, encouraged everybody, encouraged their writing. And I kind of feel like I knew Ann Petrie through Liz, even though Ann Petrie passed away in 1997. And by all accounts, Ann Petrie was the exact same way, that she uh, saw the potential in everyone, encouraged everyone, and inspired everyone. Um, I told you I'd interrupt myself a lot. So my first interruption is, you know, when you go to Old Saybrook, it's just fascinating because a couple of you went to Old Saybrook to the Historical Society there. And even though Ann Petrie and the street are famous in literature and history, when you go to this tiny town of Old Saybrook, they're just the Petries and the Jameses. Everybody still remembers them. Everybody still knows them. Their pharmacy that they ran for almost 80 years is still in the center of town and everybody remembers it. Now it's a restaurant, but um, if you go into the restaurant, there's still photos and memorabilia all over the wall of the James Pharmacy. Um, so I mention this just to say that when you go to Old Saybrook, there are people who say, you know, can recall conversations with Ann Petrie from 30, 40, 50 years back, who recall conversations in the pharmacy with her parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents. Um, and, you know, you can still get writing advice from Ann Petrie's ghost by going to Old Saybrook. Um, so, you know, people will still say, um, you know, Ann Petrie would say to them things like, if you want to be a writer, um, don't tell anyone because you'll lose steam, you'll lose interest. She said, if you have a story, just keep it in your head, keep it in your heart until you get it on paper. Because if, if you go around telling everyone the story, you lose all motivation to write it, which is pretty sound writing advice from a really acclaimed famous writer, right? Um, other writing advice from Ann Petrie is, um, it's, she said, you know, people ask me how I write, and she said, uh, I just write. So she said, I just sit down and I write out the story as best as I know it in my mind, um, in one in you know one go, and then I go back and revise. Um, so she was not the type to sit there and agonize over every sentence like the typical writer's block, right? She's just like, you know, write out the story as you know it, as it comes to you, and then you can come back to it. Um, in terms of so in terms of Liz's work, uh, she was a successful journalist and freelance writer. And after her mom, Ann Petrie, died in 1997, at age 89, Liz really carried the family history and legacy into the 21st century. Um, you, you've seen the cover of these books in the exhibit in the hallway there, um, but Liz published two books about her family history. Um, the one on the left, Can Anything Beat White? This, this book really is the, the genesis of the family history. So I told you that Ann Petrie's mom, who's the, the child in that photo, was Bertha James Lane, right? Um, she, in Old Saybrook, uh, when she passed away, Ann Petrie inherited it, and then Liz inherited it. It was a tin from the pharmacy that they shipped uh, ice cream cones in around 1910. So you can picture a big tin that used to contain ice cream cones. And after Ann Petrie died, her daughter Liz inherited this weird three foot tall tin that used to contain ice cream cones. And Liz told me that she pr had to pry off the lid. You know, she almost fell across the room trying to pry off the lid to this ice cream cone tin. When she finally pried it open, there were 400 family letters inside from 1891 to 1910. And these are letters that Ann Petrie's mother, Bertha, had written and received from her siblings, the children from that 19th century photo, and from her parents, who themselves had been enslaved and then taught themselves to read and write at, at, in their middle age. So this is a pretty remarkable find to have 400 family letters from an African-American family 
a formerly enslaved African-American family, and a family in Connecticut, which is not known for having a huge African-American population in the 1800s. So um, Can Anything Be White is Liz's um, family memoir based on those 400 letters. And then the other book, At Home Inside, is really where Liz, a few years later in 2009, uh, wrote more of a personal memoir of what it was like to be Ann Petrie's daughter. So uh, while the Can Anything Be White is really a history of the family in the 19th century, um, her, her at home inside really rounds out our picture of who Ann Petrie was as a mother, as a person, as a writer, and her experience there. So I, I highly recommend both books. I'll be giving you highlights from both books in case you, know, you don't have time to track both down, but um, a lot of my talk going forward will be highlights from, from both of those books. Um, okay, the setting, right? Hartford and Old Saybrook. So uh, I wanna just pause there. On the left is Ann Petrie's dad, Peter Clark Lane. Uh, his photo's in the exhibit. Um, he's known for a lot of things, but most known for being the first black man in Connecticut to get a pharmacist license. So he was the first licensed pharmacist in the state of Connecticut, and he did that in the 1890s. So at the height of the Jim Crow South um, is when he, or I should say the emergence of the Jim Crow South is when he did that. And on the right is Ann Petrie's father, Peter Clark Lane, in front of the drugstore, the James Family Pharmacy in Old Saybrook. And you'll see some modern day images of that. It doesn't look terribly different. So that's him in front of the pharmacy. Um, I want to just put Old Saybrook and, and Hartford in the context of Ann Petrie's larger writing. So The Street, Ann Petrie's 1946 novel, The Street, is certainly her best known book. It was her best selling book, right? It was published one year after World War II and three years before her daughter Liz was born in 1949. Um, and as many of you know, it became, its claim to fame is that The Street became the first novel by an African American woman to sell a million copies in 1946 upon its publication and ultimately sold a million and a half copies, right? Um, and in selling a million and a half copies, the street earned Ann Petrie fame and celebrity status instantly, a status that this intensely private author detested and fled from as much as possible, and I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but Ann Petrie, you know, she lived 89 years and was writing for six decades of those 89 years. So her larger body of work includes the novels Country Place, published the following year in 1947, um, and The Narrows, published in 1953, along with a dozen short stories collected and published as Miss Muriel and other stories in 1971. So living in Harlem from 1938 to 1947 inspired Ann Petrie to write The Street, Yet in the context of her long lifetime, not to mention the spans of her parents' and grandparents' lives, Harlem is really a short blip in Ann Petrie's longer life story and the longer life story of her family. Um, while she lived in Harlem for nine years, she spent the remaining 80 years of her life in the small town of Old Saybrook, Connecticut, the same town where her father, the first black man to receive a pharmacist license in the state, and her aunt, the first black woman in Connecticut to receive a pharmacist license, um, owned the James Pharmacy for almost 80 years, from 1900 to 1977. This family business, the town of Old Saybrook, and Ann Peter's experience of being the fourth generation of her African-American family to live in Connecticut shaped her life and her writing immensely. In the time I have remaining, I will tell you a bit more about the places in Connecticut and the people that Ann Peter came from. That is the town of Old Saybrook, where Ann Petrie was born in 1908 and lived most of her life, and the small capital city of Hartford, Connecticut, where her parents were both raised in the decades right after the Civil War and their emancipation. And I'll discuss the remarkable previous generations of her family, her parents, aunts, uncles, and grandparents that shaped this groundbreaking author. Ann Petrie's mother's parents had been born into slavery in the South, prohibited by state law from even learning to read or write before the Civil War. A generation later, Ann Petrie's father and aunt became the first licensed African-American pharmacist in Connecticut. And a generation after that, Ann Petrie became the first best-selling black woman novelist. It's no wonder that Ann's daughter, my friend Liz, felt called to preserve and carry on this family legacy. Um, so going to the James Pharmacy, I'd like to play you now just a short clip of the, the video that, this was produced in 2000, 22, a few months before Liz passed away, as part of that old Saybrook exhibit. So I just am playing this so you can um, hear from Liz directly. Saybrook in the 1870s and 1880s was still largely forested, with farms filling much of the remaining land, along with a few homes and businesses. 
shipping and fishing activities were found along the waters of the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound. Many merchants moved from Sabre Point and North Cove to the new business district forming uptown. It would not be until the 1890s when Peter Lane, an African American, opened a drugstore on Pennywise Lane. The Lane family was just one of a handful of black residents in this small, almost entirely white New England village. They would face and overcome difficulties and discrimination through determination, education, perseverance, and mutual support. This film is the story of their experiences on the way to becoming valued and honored members of the community and the larger society, and in particular, two remarkable women, Anna Louise James and Anne Lane Petrie. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Petrie, and I am proud to tell you the story of my family. My mother's mother, Bertha James, spent part of her summers here as a little girl in the late 1870s. Bertha and her mother, Anna Estelle Houston, were guests of a wealthy white woman by the name of Emily Malbone Morgan, who operated rest homes for poor young women. One of these homes was called Heartsease. This home still stands on the North Coast. If you Google Family Matters um, and Anne Petrie, you can find a full video online. So I, I just wanted to give you a sample of Liz Petrie's voice and, and image for that. So I wanted to move forward again, returning to Peter Clark Lane, tell you a bit more about Anne Petrie's father, Peter Clark Lane, and where he came from. Um, he migrated from New Jersey to Hartford with his parents around 1874 when he was three years old. This this is his father, Ann Petrie's paternal grandfather. Um, for the next 55 years, Peter's father, Ann Petrie's grandfather, Theodore Lane here, worked for Hartford Sis and Drug Company. Although the Hartford Current merely referred to him as an employee, Ann's grandfather, Theodore, or the Major, as everyone called him, created his own brand of medications that sold all over the world. His son, Peter, Ann Petrie's father, joined him in the family business in Hartford in the 1890s. During that decade, Peter obtained what his father never did, a pharmacist license, making him the first black man in Connecticut with that title. Ann Petrie's mother here, Bertha James Lane, was an entrepreneur in her own right, offering hairdressing and chiropody, chiropody, foot doctor services, as well as opening a fine linen store in Old Saybrook. Bertha was born in Hartford in 1875, only 10 years after the Civil War. These are Ann Petrie's grandparents, her mother's parents, Willis Samuel James on the left and Anna Houston James on the right. These photos were taken in Hartford around the 1890s. Um, Bertha's parents here, Ann Petrie's paternal grandparents, had both been born into slavery in the South. Bertha's father, Ann Petrie's grandfather, Willis Samuel James, was born on a Virginia plantation around 1843. During the Civil War, he, like thousands of other enslaved people, fled to the approaching Union Army and seized his own freedom, even before the Emancipation Proclamation was passed by Lincoln. From there, Willis made his way to Hartford, where he secured work as a coachman for the governor of Connecticut. This job gave him valuable contacts in Connecticut society and helped launch him into Hartford's small but decades-old uh, middle-class black community. He soon became a leader in Hartford's Pearl Street African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which had been founded by free African Americans three decades before the Civil War. Um, Bertha's mother on the right here was born into slavery in Alabama in 1844. And I'll say that uh, her life reads like a novel that Ann Petrie, her granddaughter, could have written. She was born in Alabama in 1844, and she was biracial. Her father uh, was not only white, but he was the plantation owner. He was the enslaver of her mother, sort of like Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, if, you've, if you're familiar with that story. Um, unfortunately, it was not uncommon at all for enslavers to have children with enslaved women uh, through all forms of sexual assault and sexual coercion, but this is a rare instance in which he brought, his, brought the family north through the Underground Railroad to free them instead of having them remain in southern slavery like so many enslavers did, right? So he brought uh, Ann Petrie's um, great-grandmother and their biracial children, six-year-old Ann Petrie's six-year-old grandmother here, to New Haven in Connecticut and, and freed them and set them up in a life in New Haven in 1850. The sad part of the story is that when Ann Petrie's great-grandfather went back to Alabama, 
his father and brothers killed him for, quote, stealing the family property. And the, quote, family property was his own six-year-old daughter and five-year-old son. So you can see the ugliness of slavery and the ugliness of legally owning your own offspring, right? So I, I refer to this really horrible story, well, it's horrible, it's also inspiring in a lot of ways what they went through to get to Connecticut and to get freedom. But I think this is relevant when we look beyond the street to the larger body of Ann Petrie's work because her own family's history of slavery, history of enslavement, her own grandmother's escape through the Underground Railroad to Connecticut as a six-year-old really shaped her writing and her imagination for the rest of her life. So in addition, The Street is really obviously about a black mother in Harlem in the 1940s, but some of her lesser-known work, Anne Petrie wrote a biography of Harriet Tubman for young adults, um, inspired by the fact that her own grandmother had escaped on the Underground Railroad, like those Harriet Tubman led to freedom. And then, have you heard of her young adult novel? It's called Tichuba of Salem Village. Um, that's part of, I actually read that as a middle schooler in Connecticut, having no idea who Ann Petrie was, having real no idea of the history of slavery in New England. Um, but years later I found out, oh wow, that's, that's my friend Liz's mom who wrote that book. And really, Tichuba of Salem Village, um, Tichuba was an uh, enslaved woman from Africa who was the first accused of witchcraft during the Salem witchcraft trials of 1692. So Ann Petrie, um, kind of absorbing this family history of enslavement, of escape from slavery, of survival of slavery, um, went on to write books not only about free, free black families like hers, uh, middle class black families like hers, but also enslaved women that inspired her, like Harriet Tubman and Tichup of Salem Village. So it's really a remarkable family history in so, in so many ways. Um, so going from her ancestors to her own life. Um, this is Ann Petrie as a child on the left in Old Saybrook with her dad, Peter Clark Lane, the first pharmacist. Um, giving a little bit about her biography, she was born Anna Houston Lane, named after her grandmother, Anna Houston, the one who's, who, was, who came here, here through the Underground Railroad as a six-year-old um, in 1908 in the second floor quarters above her family's far, pharmacy. Um, no Ann Petrie's later name changed from Anna to Anne, one of her many acts of self-invention and reinvention. Ann Petrie's parents moved from Hartford to Old Saybrook in 1900 when they opened the family drugstore. Um, and just to give you some context, in moving to a small town like Old Saybrook, um, Ann's, Ann's parents were truly trailblazing bla black entrepreneurs. Um, back in Hartford, the African-American population had been small before the Great Migration, only about 2,000 African-Americans in a city of nearly 80,000 people, so just 2%. Um, but upon moving to Old Saybrook, with its 1,400 white residents, um, the Petries were two of only about 36 black people in the whole town of Old Saybrook. And of those 36 black people, they were the only uh, business owner. So they were really one of a kind. So you can kind of see the, the special status they had in Old Saybrook, right? The idea that there were only 36 black people at all in this, in this village of 1,400 people, and they were certainly the only black business owners. Um, Anne Petrie's daughter, Liz, wrote in her memoir, quote, based on descriptions in her short stories, on notes in her journals, and on stories she told, mother's early years in the little village of Saybrook were in some ways idyllic and in other ways horrific. Um, some, some people had tried to run them off as soon as they opened the business, saying they didn't want any, quote, N-words in old Saybrook. Um, the father, Peter Clark Lane, um, said, well, tell them I'm from Madagascar and we kill people with, their bare ha with our bare hands. So he was not gonna be run off. Um, he, I think there's a good chance his grandparents were from Madagascar, but he completely kind of played up this idea of himself as you know, playing with this trope of uncivilized or, or savage to say that if you try to run me out, I'll kill you with my bare hands. So that, that didn't work. So they were staying, they were staying in Old Saybrook um, and they went on to become involved in the local church, local politics and leaders in the black community. Um, at the same time, um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the obstacles they overcame, but I want to also talk about the other major figure in the story. This is Miss James. This is Ann Petrie's aunt, who was the first black woman pharmacist uh, licensed in the state of Connecticut. Here she is standing in front of the James Family Pharmacy in 1918 when she was about 32. Um, one cool story that Liz used to tell about Miss James, Ann Petrie's aunt, is that Catherine Hepburn said she was the only woman who ever intimidated her. Now, how was Catherine Hepburn? Catherine Hepburn vacationed in Old Saybrook every year from 1913 until her death. So 
Catherine, the actress Catherine Hepburn, Hepburn and other rich people would come to Old Saybrook every summer and the pharmacy was kind of a mainstay for everybody. That's where they got uh, prescriptions, ice cream, postcards, soda. So she was a known entity to everyone, including uh, Catherine Hepburn. Um, she was, in 1908, she became the only woman and the only African American in her graduating class of the Brooklyn College of Pharmacy. Um, that's her graduation photo on the left, which is on display in the exhibit. And then I just want to point out, this is her great, uh, her great niece, Liz, wearing that same necklace eight, uh, 90 years later. So you can kind of see that necklace in, in color. Three years later, in 1911, at age 25, Miss James became the first licensed black female pharmacist in Connecticut. Uh, she took over the James Pharmacy from her brother-in-law and Petrie's father, Peter Lane, and ran it until her death in 1977 at age 91. Um, let me skip ahead a little bit. Ann Petrie wrote in her journal years later, quote, we use this formality, Miss James, because we felt the whole town would be calling her aunt or auntie and probably would have loved to if we had. Um, think of the racist caricature of Aunt Jemima that they were contending with, right? Um, and, and Miss James maintained her dignity by going by Miss, even within her own family. Um, in her wonderfully evocative short story, Miss Muriel, Ann Petrie turns the James Pharmacy itself into a sort of character. She captures with sharp precision how her family navigated and maintained the boundaries between their inner worlds, their dignity as individuals, and the integrity of their family in this all-white community, um, despite the, the child narrator in Miss Muriel, based on Ann Petrie's own child self, is appalled when Mr. Beamish, an old white shoemaker, tries to court Aunt Sophrenia, the character based on Miss James, aunt, her Aunt Anna. Um, as the child narrator chides Ms., Mr. Beamish, quote, the front part of the building, the part where the drugstore is, belongs to everybody. The back of our building and upstairs and the yard are ours. The yard is a private part of our lives. You don't belong in it. You're not part of the family. I bring this up to say both that Ann Petrie's short stories are wonderful and we should read them, and also just to say that the front part of the building, the drugstore, was where the James family were public figures, serving any white person who came in for medicine, ice cream, postcards, or soda. Upstairs and in their home and out back, they belonged only to each other as husband and wife, father and daughter, aunt and niece. Most important, they belonged to themselves in their own minds and intellects, which me leads me to Ann Petrie's self-development as a writer. This is Ann Petrie um, at her typewriter while writing The Street. And this actually, once The Street sold a million copies and she became a celebrity, um, Ebony Magazine, the major black magazine at the time, republished this of her um, spoken at her typewriter. But just to give you some biography, some background, Ann Petrie did not start out as a writer. She started out as a pharmacist, like her father, grandfather, and aunt before her. After graduating from Old Saybrook High School in 1926, she briefly attended Hampton Normal and Industrial Institute, the historically black college in Virginia that her mother's sister, Aunt Helen, had attended a generation earlier. Um, after one year there, Ann Petrie shunned the courses in meal preparation and household expenses that were the, designed to train young black women like her as homemakers. If Ann Petrie hadn't broken away as a 19-year-old, the street and her other contributions to literature might never have been written. Um, but first, Petrie took one more detour as a pharmacist, receiving her degree at the Connecticut College of Pharmacy in New Haven. As, uh, there she felt inferior to her peers, due more to class than racism. Her classmates from New Haven's black elite, including Jane Bolin, who became the first uh, female African-American judge in New York State, and whose father was the black graduate of Williams College, Petrie wrote in her journal a decade later, quote, in comparison to all these people, I was fat, had no perceptible waistline, had no clothes, no money, no boyfriends, um, and was not well supplied with funds. The Jameses had respect, intelligence, and dignity, but remained working class, the pharmacy providing them a living, but not a glamorous one. After graduating in 1931, at the height of the Great Depression, Petrie spent several years behind the counter of her family drugstore in Old Saybrook. Six decades later, after receiving her fourth honorary degree, she wrote in her journal, quote, I think that's amazing. Started out as a pharmacist, ended up as a writer with all kinds of acclaim. Really quite extraordinary. 
her, her path wasn't easy. While working at the pharmacy, Petrie began submitting her first short stories for publication and received nothing but one rejection letter after another. Um, as an aside, anybody who's attempted to publish their writing is well familiar with that experience. Aside from Petrie's mother, Bertha, her family, you might be surprised to find out her family did not encourage her aspiration to become a writer. Miss James even scolded her for, quote, wasting all that money on postage from all these rejection letters that kept coming back. Now, that might seem really surprising, but I want to point out that uh, Miss James and Petrie's aunt and the other relatives who raised her were ambitious, educated, and hardworking. They'd gone from slavery to college educations in just one generation, but they had been pharmacists and teachers entrepreneurs and educators. Writing fiction probably seemed impractical and more of a hobby than a career to these um, ambitious people. They saw themselves as leaders of the race who had communities of black children to teach and professional barriers to break. Writing fiction might have seemed too self-indulgent. But in her 20s and 30s, Petrie took a gamble on her writing, and as we know, it paid off. In 1938, shortly after she married George Petrie, Liz's father, the couple moved from Old Saybrook, Connecticut to Harlem. There she wrote for the left-wing black newspaper, The People's Voice. Um, as Petrie's daughter Liz wrote, living in Harlem, quote, amounted to culture shock for the young woman from the Pastora village of Old Saybrook, as she witnessed urban poverty created by segregation and other structural racism for the first time up close. In Harlem, Petrie had access to experiences and people far remo removed from her family at the small town pharmacy in Old Saybrook. In addition to her newspaper work at The People's Voice, a Columbia University course with Mabel Louise Robinson helped launch her career as a writer. A professor of English at Columbia University, Robinson became an important mentor and teacher in Petrie's life. While living in Harlem, her short stories still being rejected one after another. Um, Anne Petrie uh, read the memoir of a well-known lawyer named Arthur Train. And Arthur Train wrote, quote, if I wanted to be a writer and I was young, the first thing I would do would be to go to Columbia and see if I could enroll in Mabel Louise Robinson's workshop in writing. Petrie instantly decided to do that. She enrolled in the workshop. To apply, she had to submit a short story. As Petrie recalled in 1988, quote, I made an appointment for an interview and took, in my story, my hot, I took my story in my hot little hand, and I can see her now. Professor Robbins looked me over very carefully, and she sat and read the story in front of me, which is also embarrassing. Then she put it down, looked at me, and said, well, that's a very good story. I thanked her, and she told me when the course met, and that was it. Um, within three years, Petrie's best-selling novel, The Street, came out, uh, shaped by her experience of living in Harlem and of her experience in Professor Robinson's writing course. Uh, but Petrie never felt fully at home in Harlem and felt even less at home with the attention and fame that becoming a best-selling author brought her overnight. As she recounted in her journal, quote, shortly after The Street was published, I decided I had a choice. Either become a professional writer, a celebrity, and lose whatever privacy I had, to be public property, or to be a writer. I opted for being a writer. In order to write, I needed privacy and anonymity, and I fiercely defended it. Moving to Connecticut was no accident. It was deliberate. So Petrie uh, published The Street, became a celebrity, and then instantly retreated to Old Saybrook because she wanted that quiet village life. And this is kind of remarkable. Another thing is that, in addition, um, when she moved back to Old Saybrook, Miss James, her aunt, the first black female pharmacist in Connecticut, she was so well known that people mistook her for her aunt. So here she is, this celebrity writer, but in Old Saybrook, her aunt was the famous one. And she really liked that. She loved her anonymity. And um, Liz writes in the memoir how her mom would pretty much turn down almost every speaking engagement she was invited to. She hated public appearances. She avoided them as much as possible. And she, quote, called it pressing the flesh. She said, the world is entitled to my writing. So here we all are reading the street, um, you know, almost 80 years later. But she felt that we were not entitled to her life, her as a person. Um, she hated invasive, uh, personal questions. She hated personal interviews. So there's so few of them. And I also think about, she died in 1997. She would have hated social media, right? She died a few years before Facebook. Social media was so antithetical to everything Ann Petrie was and stood for. She really felt like, Writing was a secret, private, sacred, solitary activity that you kind of go inside yourself, you tell the story, you write out the story, you don't tell everyone about the story because you'll lose steam, and then you can reveal it. And the writing has a life of its own, right? And she felt like 
her, the, her writing was for the world, but she herself wasn't. So um, if you read Liz Petrie's At Home Inside, um, she starts out her memoir by saying, my mom did not want this book to exist. So she did not write about her mom till after her mom died in, um, for that very reason, because she was so private. Um, so uh, as I said, within a few years, they were back in old Saybrook. I just, I just want to um, play a couple clips for you, I want to pause here in the time I have left. So you saw that this this came out. This is a very rare um, newsreel that came out right after uh, the Narrows was published, 1950. In Old Saybrook, Connecticut, lives the author of the critically acclaimed novel The Narrows, Anne Petrie. Her third and latest. It took five years. In that time, she brought up a daughter while writing and rewriting to perfection a book praised for its depth and human perception. The literary world eagerly awaits her next, but her family got hurt. So there's, that's Liz, age uh, four. And then this is, she hated TV appearances, but she made this one TV appearance in 1975. illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, professor of children's literature with Temple University. From Old Saybrook, Connecticut, comes today's guest, Anne Petrie, who writes for both children and adults. When we wanted to arrange Ms. Petrie's visit, I had to contact her in Hawaii because in 1974-75, she taught literature and creative writing at the University of Hawaii. Do share anything that you think will be of interest concerning your Hawaiian experiences. Well, I, I have to say first that Hawaii is so beautiful that it's unbelievable. In spite of all the stories and all the pictures, you don't really have any idea what it's like until you are there. And that applies also to the people who are stunning looking. I have a couple of amusing stories. One of them, when I reached the end of spring semester in a creative writing class, I said to my students, well now is there anything that you would like to ask me? Do you have any questions? And I thought that they were going to ask questions about writing. And one young man, and I can only describe him as a brash young man, he really was, he was huge, great, enormous shoulders, a very athletic, uh, said, well, there is one thing I would like to know. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, what does your husband do for a living? And I said, well, of course, I'd be very happy to answer that question. But I would like to point out to you that you have been conditioned by the culture in which you live, because it would never occur to you to ask a man what his wife did for a living. And as far as what my husband does for a living, I'd be happy to tell you he is a retired advertising executive, and he used to be in New York City. And that was that. And the other story, favorite, and these are curious sidelights on uh, Hawaii. I won't, I won't play beyond that, but I would just like to go on and talk a little bit in the remaining time I have left what this also says about um, Anne Petrie's lifelong fight against the constraints of sexism as well as racism, right? In that 1950s clip, um, 1950s style patriarchy and sexism are on full display as that male narrator literally speaks for Anne Petrie, assuring us that although she's a famous author, she's a wife and mother first, right? Um, so he was assuring his, his, in the second clip, a rare 1975 TV appearance, Anne Petrie pushes back against sexism, just as she pushed back against racism her whole life. And that leads me to my last point, how she balanced her writing with her sense of responsibility to her large, close-knit family that surrounded her in Old Saybrook. Um, I'll say sometimes she did balance them, and sometimes she put her writing aside for months and even years at a time. Um, in fact, some people in the 1970s, a reporter said, uh, 
what, did you stop write? Why did you stop writing? And she said, well, first of all, I haven't stopped writing. Second of all, in the past year alone, I've been a nurse to my ailing aunt. I've been a real estate agent selling my family pharmacy. I've been a mother. I've been a, a cousin. So she saw her, her work as encompassing all of this, right? That um, her, her body of work was her writing, but also who she was as a person. Um, one important, often overlooked consideration is that Petrie wrote The Street during World War II while her husband served in the army and Anne Petrie was living alone for the first and only time in her 89 year life. During World War II, Rosie the Riveter went to the factory while Anne Petrie was glued to her typewriter. The other women in her Columbia University writing workshop were also the wives of soldiers who were off to war, giving them newfound free time for their writing. Um, and their, their professor, Mabel Louise Robinson, was a lesbian, giving her a sort of lifelong freedom from the common demands and constraints of mid-20th century marriage, motherhood, and gender norms. Um, even after the war, Petrie deferred having her only child, Liz, until 1949 at nearly 41 years old, a highly unusual move for the time. During that time, she managed to publish her second novel, Country Place, in 1947, just one year after the street. These couple years during and immediately after World War II proved to be the most productive of Petrie's long writing career. Um, yet even as she struggled to balance her writing with the expectations of being a wife and mother, a daughter and a niece, her family and their hometown inspired her personally and creatively immensely. Old Saybrook became the small town setting of Petrie's second novel, Country Place, a sharp contrast to the Harlem depicted in the street. Um, nine years earlier, Petrie was living in Harlem, but happened to be visiting her parents in Old Saybrook when the 1938 hurricane struck, trapping her in the small Connecticut coastal town. And that became the setting for Country Place, uh, which took place in Old Saybrook during, during the 1938 hurricane. Um, at the same time, Aunt Petrie's daughter Liz wrote of her mother saying, quote, taking care of friends and relatives gave her a sense of accomplishment she had not seemed to fill with her writing. Cooking, shopping, and cleaning for a family three did not satisfy her urge to nurture, and she spent years caring for various ailing relatives between 1949 and 1988. A large cast of characters moved through her life seeking advice or just a sympathetic ear, and some of them truly were characters. Many times she exhausted herself caring for everyone. Um, in a little bit, I'll show you a clip from this forthcoming documentary film that introduced you a bit more to her aunts and uncles. Um, and, and cousins who she talked about. But I want to just briefly, of all the aunts and uncles who inspired her, I think crucial ones are Miss James, the first black pharmacist, and then I just want to mention her mother's other sister, Aunt Helen Chisholm. Um, she, uh, in, she was kind of the most immediate inspiration for Aunt Petrie as an aunt who was, who was a woman who was an educated, uh, professional. So she, after graduating from Hampton Institute, a historically black college, um, in 1900, her Aunt Helen went and traveled through the Jim Crow South by herself, teaching at, at black schools. Um, she then went on to Hawaii by herself as a, as a young black woman in 1900 and taught there for four years. And then when she came back, to, she went to Atlanta after that and was a student of W.B. Du Bois for a couple years, the um, author of The Souls of Black Folk. So she was kind of I would say Anne Petrie's most immediate inspiration. Um, in her short story, Miss Muriel, um, she says that Aunt Helen's the one who brought culture to the family, who played Bach and Beethoven on the, on the piano and who taught courses and wrote articles. So I just wanna briefly quote, Aunt Helen in 1932 uh, wrote an article about the future of black women in this country. Um, she insisted that, quote, any discussion of achievement must take into consideration the fact that achievement is related to opportunity as well as initiative, talent, and energy. Have the quote, Negro women of this country opportunity, and if given opportunity, have they talent and energy to achieve? Anne Petrie's Aunt Helen concluded that, although black women certainly possess the talent and energy, opportunities remain severely limited for them. Um, she insisted these women have, quote, great capacity for organization and direction. Opportunity is not given them, they create it. And I just want to point out at that very moment, uh, just up the road at the James Pharmacy, Helen's 24-year-old niece, Ann Petrie, was creating her own opportunity. Working in her family's pharmacy by day, she wrote short stories by night, creating a path of opportunity that finally came to fruition 14 years later with the publication of her best-selling novel, The Street. Uh, but she did not forge that path alone. Her family, from her formerly enslaved grandparents, who built lives of dignity and refinement in Connecticut, to her entrepreneurial parents, to her college-educated aunts, shaped the incredible woman and the acclaimed author that she became. I'd like to pause there.
And then um, in the time I have remaining, I want to point out one last thing, and that is Anne, um, Anne Petrie's cousin, or first cousin once removed, is named Ashley James. And he's a well-known filmmaker who for the past several years, initially with Liz Petrie's collaboration, is making a documentary based on those 400 family letters that were found in that um, ice cream cone tin. So um, Ashley James is the, the cousin and a nationally acclaimed filmmaker who's making this documentary. Um, and I, in, the, in the last few minutes I have remaining, I just want to show you a trailer for this documentary to sort of further highlight some of the people and events I've been talking about. And uh, Ashley wants us to know that in the final version, there will be film actors. So he's the narrator for all the parts right now, but he wants you to know that there will be different film actors. And in fact, they're using AI to recreate Anne Petrie's voice so she can speak in her own voice decades after her death. So there'll also be AI voice in the, in the final version. I am a New Englander, a Connecticut Yankee. Four generations of my family have been born in Connecticut. So to borrow a phrase from the Quakers, I am a birthright New Englander. But of course, I am not. I am an outsider, not a member of the club, because my grandfather, Willis Samuel James was a runaway slave who came here on the Underground Railroad before the Civil War. Anne Petrie is actually the link between a writer like Zora Neale Hurston, who publishes her best-known novels in the 30s, and the writers who we come to know in the 70s, someone like Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, or Toni K. Bambara. Petrie is one of the first women to give us a complicated working class African American woman character dealing with issues like racism and sexism. I think what I admire about Anne Petrie's work, especially about her novel The Street, is she really captures that feeling of Harlem in transition and maybe Harlem on the brink. Just a few years after, you have Langston Hughes' montage of Dream Deferred with its famous well, What Happens to a Dream Deferred the question that became Raisin in the Sun, and all that uh, history, I think, you sort of starts for me with Anne Petrie's The Street. One of the things that she writes about is being a Connecticut Yankee, born and raised in Old St. Brook, Connecticut. But she's very clear about the fact that she is not a member of the club. She is not a Connecticut Yankee. In fact, she describes herself as a survivor born in the USA. Old Saybrook is a very old town. It's filled with the smell of salt and the sound of water birds. I knew the difference in the smell of the air when the tide was going out and how it freshened when the tide was coming in. The coves and inlets and creeks offer a perfect resting place for migratory birds. It's the picture-perfect New England village. Except the reality for me was something different. There's an ancient burial ground in town said to be the oldest cemetery in Connecticut. In the back, there's a gravestone with the name Rose Jackson, a colored woman. There's no other gravestone near it. It's the 19th century equivalent of the back of the bus. And it's not only segregated, but the stone is facing backwards. Sister Rose Jackson's grave looks to the rear. New England, in many ways, was the most homogeneous white region in the United States. William Lloyd Garrison called Connecticut the Georgia of the North. And despite a record of abolition and support for the Underground Railroad that's exemplary, that kind of undercurrent of racism among most white people in the state of Connecticut 
was consistent from the beginning of the Civil War through to World War I, and in fact, it increased after World War I and beyond. How did my family manage to survive intact in this largely white community? How did my parents manage to give their children a sense of self-confidence, self-worth? My father, Peter Clark Lane Jr., was a licensed pharmacist. He opened a drugstore in Old Saybrook in 1902. And my mother, Bertha James Lane, was the eldest daughter of Willis James' six children. She was the rock of our family a self-made entrepreneur, a mentor, and a guardian to all of us. And I had these amazing aunts and uncles. My Aunt Helen was a school teacher who taught in the Hawaiian Islands and created a successful correspondence course in reading and literature. My Aunt Lou, Anna Louise James, was the first woman pharmacist in Connecticut. She took over my father's drugstore in the 1920s and it became the James Pharmacy. It remains a landmark, even today. And I had these extraordinary uncles. They were footloose and fancy free, and lived all over the world. They were roustabouts with circuses, seamen, Pullman porters, barbers. One of them smuggled Chinese workers between the US and Canada. One of them was a Buffalo soldier in the Spanish-American War. One spent time on a Georgia chain gang sentenced to five years after being caught in a small town after sunset. My uncles and aunts were storytellers, yarn spinners, and letter writers. Through these letters, I survived the pain. I learned about the world outside of Old Seabrook. Hampton, February 18, 1902. Dear Peter, it has been snowing for the last two days and the weather is really sloppy. The farm work has stopped for a while, and the snow was about four inches deep yesterday. There are about 500 colored boys here, and about 100 Indians. The Indians room in a large brick building called the Wigwam. The colored boys room in about eight different buildings. One of the Indian boys died in the hospital last week. His death was brought on by an accident he had last fall. His body was sent to Cherokee, North Carolina, for he belonged to the Cherokee Indian tribe there. My dear Bertha, is it long since I've written you? I have no idea whatever, yet it seems weeks since I remember writing. On the broad veranda on which I am writing, one can look for miles across the Pacific, the eye traveling down the hillsides covered with sugarcane, coffee, and bananas. It seems as though the wonders of this place are inexhaustible. Nearly every night, the sky is brilliantly illuminated by the light from the volcano. And I have read, there is nothing dangerous from the lava flow. Saturday morning, Queen Lilua Kalani called, accompanied by her attendant and ward, Joseph Leah. She was very regal and gracious, and she shook my hand. Just think, I have met a queen. With my aloas to all, I am ever fondly yours, Helen L. James. Jessup, Georgia, November 1st, 1905. My dear sister, I would not write again, but I am in a terrible fix that I got into after leaving Savannah, Georgia. While going through this place, I shot a white man for bothering me, and I tried to get away, but they put the bloodhounds on my track, and they caught me in a swamp and tried to lynch me. But the sheriff held him from me and got me to the jail where I am at present. I get tried Monday morning, but the sheriff is afraid they'll get me when I'm taken to the trial. He told me if I had any folks, I had better write to them at once and try to raise $35 to pay off his guards before the trial, and he would spirit me away in the night to Florida. Now, Bertha, for dear mother's sake, don't let me stay here to be killed by these white folks when a little of nothing will save me. Do this, 
and I will never forget your kindness. Kiss Louise for me, and if I never see you again, may God bless you and protect you. Goodbye from your own dear brother, Will James. documentary. This is just the trailer, that, um, but it's in production. It's being finished soon. So in the remaining time I've left, I'd love questions, discussions, open it out. I've studied and taught African-American literature. And, you know, I, Richard Wright, James Bull, Lorraine Hanster, Sarah Lee first. I, I've read them all. I've never heard a Petrie before this semester. How come? I think, wow, um, I do think part of her own uh, private nature helped that. You know, I think that she shied away from uh, publicity and attention. I think that's a big part of it. I also think uh, that she, um, so she shied away from attention. I also think she doesn't quite fit easily into categories. So for instance, um, in speaking of categories, so at the time, um, people call, some people said she was the female Richard Wright, for instance, because her book, The Street, came out a year after Richard Wright's Black Boy. And she hated these kind of false categorizations, false comparisons. So I think that she might have fallen through the cracks of these genres, fallen through the cracks of these categories, that you know, her protest novel was eclipsed by black men's protest novels. And then her books about white people, like Country Place, didn't really fit into the genre of this new black literature that was coming out in the 50s and 60s. So I think it's more a genre problem than a problem with her, her writing. You know what I mean? I, do, I think that that's a big, a big issue. Um, I will say, luckily, that all of her books that I've mentioned are in print and have all been reissued within the past decade. So the, the books, I kind of feel like she's having a renaissance is my point, that it's only within the past 10 years that new issues of the Narrows and Country Place have come out from Northwestern University Press and others. Um, I would say that Liz was instrumental, her daughter was instrumental in getting those books back into print. Um, and now it's sort of upon all of us to like, teach her writing, spread the word. I think this documentary helps um, I hope that's a satisfactory answer, but I do. Th I think, I think it's. Inter she was at this weird intersection in terms of gendered categories, racial categories. Um, she kind of defied genre. She defied categorization, and she was also herself kind of private and not self-aggrandizing. So I think all those things make her, hard, she, you know, made made her harder to pin down or sort of harder to be a representative of one thing, you know, or one category. Yeah. I first heard the, you know, I, I didn't know the name, and I looked at the date of the book, and it's been around for a long time. Uh, I thought yeah. it was going to be, you know, 2003 or something. 1946, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Yeah, I'll try this. I'm not sure I can articulate this. Um, so I facilitate a um, library book club, and we read this book uh, last month or so, and nobody had... <coughs> heard of it or read it before. Everyone loved it. Uh, some people thought it was shocking that it was published back in uh, the decade it was, the time it was. It felt very new. Um, people were shocked that she wasn't from Harlem. And so is it temp my question, is it tempting to, you know, you, we're always trying to separate the, bio the autobiography from the, mm. the work itself. but. When you give us her family history and their trajectory from slavery into Connecticut, um, there's sort of an anomaly all throughout there, and the book itself also, you know, the, the popularity of it, the, the readership, the fact that it has eight million different covers, the fact that it's still in print, the fact that nobody's heard of it and everybody loves it when they do find it, um, and they feel like they're discovering it for the first time. It almost feels like, and her, her desire to keep it quiet, mm -hmm. is it tempting to, to not try to separate? Like, is there a new literary gesture to not separate the story from this book? I would say so. Um, from now again, I'm in, his, I'm in history more than literary criticism, but there is an archival turn in literary studies where uh, literary scholars are trying to excavate the lives of the authors and you go deep into the archive and look at those intersections between the biography of the author and the, the work. Um, so I would absolutely say 
you know, and Liz herself in her memoir basically said, um, I think the fact that she wasn't from Harlem could have contributed to it in the sense that here she is, again, defying all categories. She's black, but she's from a nearly all white village in Connecticut. Um, she's, you know, middle class, but her family is facing racism and has, you know, working class, and she has these left-wing pro-labor policies, uh, uh, opinions. But then she goes to Harlem, and she was kind of, like, things like seeing people drunk on the street coming out of bars. Like, this horrified her sensibility. Like, there were, you know, Old Saybrook was, you know, one, one, little, one little road, it still is. So I think she approached Harlem in some ways as a visitor, well, as a visitor, as an outsider, sort of as a spectator, so she saw it from a vantage point that she would not have if she had been, been born and raised there. So in some ways, it's almost like a, a travel perspective, sort of, you know, this, this outside view. So in some ways, the fact that she's not from Harlem, I think, was a big part of it. But, you know, I didn't have time to get into, you know, there's so many things I cut out because of the limitations of time. But, you know, people are sometimes shocked that she, you know, they're saying, how did this genteel woman who spoke like the Queen of England write the street, right? <laughs> um, but she recalls in Old Saybrook, for example, her first day of school from kindergarten, coming home and boys from her class throwing stones at her and, and tearing her dress. And, you know, so being literally, you know, being, having th stones thrown at you as a four-year-old, um, I think, of course, she could not, she was no stranger to sort of horror, racist horror, violence. So that kind of, in terms of, you know, ex life experience, it's like you can be middle class and genteel and refined, but also be subjected to like racialized, raci racist horror at four years old in a way that sort of, you know, certainly disillusions you for the rest of your life. So she was a very disillusioned, uh, genteel person. You know, she did not, she was not up in the ivory tower at all because of her race you know, and because of her family background. Or like in the, you know, she's saying in, in her journal, like, I'm a Yankee in the sense that I lived in this small Connecticut town my whole life. Um, I go to the congregational church. Um, I plan the library book sales, but I'm not part of the club. You know, I'm the descendant of enslaved people. And the townspeople can't share that experience because they're, they're the descendants of enslavers. And in terms of Connecticut and all that, um, I do think one thing that's interesting about this, this, if you look at Anne Petrie's family on her father's side and her mother's side, basically every facet of black history and US history is represented in her ancestors. So on her dad's side, they had been enslaved in the North, in New Jersey. On her mom's side, they'd been enslaved in, in Virginia and Alabama. So you have Northern slavery, Southern slavery. Um, some went South, some remained in New England. So they fanned out all over the country to Hawaii. You know, it's pretty incredible. Um, so I, I think, I think coming from that family background, such widely traveled aunts and uncles and parent, grandparents and those who wrote such prolific letters and such vivid letters. Um, she was from this little village in Connecticut, but you know, at a young age, her imagination was global, right? Like she had, you know, she, she had been reading about the Queen of Hawaii since she was a kid and through, through her aunt's very personal letters. So, um, I, you know, that she said that world opened up to her through her family and what great writers and storytellers and travelers they were, which is not typical at all. Um, most people, few people of any race were going to Hawaii and Virginia and, and, you know, Florida in 1898. You know, that was, they were somewhat exceptional as such wide travelers and, you know, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and just to follow up, which suggests that she has an authenticity that can't be pinned down and that as a reader, you can't argue with it. You know, she gets right. she gets to tell this. She has yeah. all the sort of credentials that we, you know, Harper Lee maybe shouldn't be telling the story of the South or that novel American Bird, you know, there's things who gets to speak. Um, mm -hmm. and that's maybe part of why we weren't reading, you know, that people didn't know where to put her and didn't really want to hear it in some way because there was nothing you could say except to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and she got some pushback from other white, from white authors and white friends being like, your work's too brutal. And she's like, this is reality. Um, I think now in this moment, more people are ready to hear really brutal things, brutally honest things, some, not, you know, there's also a backlash to that. But, you know, in the 40s and 50s, she got pushed back from people she considered friends being like, we don't, you know, this is, this is too much. This is, this is horrifying. Like, we don't, you know, so, um, 
tone it down, you know? So that could be part of it too. Yeah, yeah. I would just say, I mean, and, and then in terms of sort of that Rose Jackson, the only black woman in the cemetery in Old Saybrook, I mean, for context, um, Connecticut and Rhode Island were really twin states in terms of the history of slavery here. So within New England, Connecticut and Rhode Island had the most enslaved people and were the, um, in, were the most involved in the triangle trade, the transatlantic slave trade. So I, if you just go within a few miles of here, I'm sure you'll find graves of enslaved people here in Bristol as well. So this is not unique to Old Saybrook. Um, do you know about the DeWolf family of Bristol? Um, okay, okay. So <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, you know, the DeWolfs, here they are in New England, and in the late 1700s, they were the largest traffickers in enslaved people from Africa with, in all of the United States. And that's because in the late 1700s, there was no north-south divide over slavery, that slavery was, you know, throughout the Americas. So New England was the leader in the triangle trade because there had not been this sort of Mason-Dixon line developing yet, you know? So I'm glad you all know that story. So, and, it, and it's not unique, I mean, that documentary Trace of the Trade made the DeWolf family kind of famous or infamous, but Middletown, Connecticut, where I teach and live, they, hundreds of enslaved people were brought up the Connecticut River to Middletown in the Triangle Trade as well. So it's not like, like Bristol's now become the kind of the poster for it, but um, all of this is to say that when, Liz, when Ann Petrie's grandparents came here from the South, they encountered a history of slavery and racism in New England that was homegrown to New England. They weren't, they didn't escape race, they didn't escape slavery, they, they escaped Southern slavery and then fit within a sort of a, a racial hierarchy here that came out of Northern slavery, right? And that's, that's how Ann Petrie ended up having stones thrown at her her first day of kindergarten. It wasn't the South made them do it, it's the North had this long history of slavery and, and racism as well. So, so many threads to this story. Um, and I just wanted to communicate that, that you know, there's so many threads to the family story, and then once you think about the family and Ann Petrie's biography, putting the street in context of the dozens of other things she published in her 89 year long life, right? And I'm interested in all of that. And I think it, hopefully it helps sort of put the street in that sort of panoramic 360 degree view, right? That it's not an isolated, you know, to just, this novel, that it fits in the body of her life, her larger work, and then this really fascinating web of relatives that she came from. Yeah. I would say being from Connecticut, I think she has some local, you know, local cred. Um, people know about her as an old Saybrook person, but it's interesting that if you go just to the next state, you know, she wasn't being assigned, and Petrie's work, I mean. Um, so that's a problem that we're addressing, but should be addressed. Yeah. Um, so I just want to like know your opinion. Like a lot of us students talk about like books we read in high school. So it's like Scarlet Letter, Great Gatsby, Catcher in the Rye, things like that. Um, do you think that the street would be like something good to teach in high schools for the younger generation, or do you think that would kind of go against Anne Peters' wishes of being this like private writer? Oh. Um so I, so let me clarify. I, the answer is yes, it should be. Um, I just want to clarify that Anne Petrie drew a real sharp line between her writing and her personal life, the rest of her life. So she wasn't like, don't read my books. She was just like, don't read my books and then call me and ask me all these personal questions about my life. I don't want to, you know? So I, I, and I think going back to that question about biography, here we are after her death sort of dissecting her life and its place, but within her lifetime, she tried to really not be a quote celebrity, not have her life dissected. But you know, in the passage of time, I think it's fair game to say who was she as a person, right? So, and she did, I should also say, this family left a lot of material. Like she left dozens and dozens of journals that are now at, some of you saw drafts of the street at Yale, the letters are at Yale. Um, Ann Petrie herself gave Boston University archives some of her journals, but she did edit them first. So she was like, you don't get a full, you know, you don't get an unedited view of me, but here's dozens of my journals that kind of, so she did leave some of her inner thoughts for the archive, yeah. So I don't want to be misconstrued. I don't think, I don't think we should suppress her books, just I'm saying within her lifetime, it's just interesting to think about her philosophy of sort of the writer as private person versus the work, right? And their, their work is public. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yes? I'm curious, and you may not know this, and if anyone knows this, I'm curious who her readership was. If she mm. cut across all these, you know, five categorization, were they New Yorkers, were they Suburbanites, were they That's Black, were they White? Who yeah. bought the line half a million copies of the book? That's 
That's fascinating. I'm not sure if, I don't know if we have a record of the distribution of those million and a half copies, like geographically. Um, are you like, are these sort of like Northeasterners, like uh, who, cosmopolitan folks? Um, that's, that's a really good question. I wish I knew off the top of my head where these million and a half copies were distributed to. I mean, I do, th I was thinking about this a lot in this sort of this immediate post-World War II moment where like Richard Wright's book, Black Boy, becomes a sensation. So there was this moment after World War II, like just defeated the Nazis and fascism where things were opening up a bit and there was kind of this, this like more of this liberalism, like uh, what are our American values, our American traditions of you know equality and um, of course Jim Crow didn't end for a long time thereafter, but I think it was, if this come out before World War II, I think it would have been a different story. You know, there wouldn't have been that reception. So I think it was just like, opening up in the post-World War II. But that's, I'll try to get an answer to that, sort of where these were being distributed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I will say, um, I hope that with, especially with her short stories and her other book, there's a real rich body of work to dip into with Anne Petrie, and I hope it does get a wider and wider recognition. And hope you all see that documentary when it's, when it's finished. So, anything else? Well, thanks, this was a pleasure. Thank you for having me.